Hello everybody, my name is Sue Shardlow, I'm the Developer Community Manager here at Redis. It's really good to see you all again. I'm here today for a fireside chat with Rachel Ellidge, who is one of the technical writers in the Redis Docs team. We're going to be demystifying technical writing and how to get into the field today. So the reason why we're doing this um, series of events is because it is currently Hacktoberfest, and as the name suggests, Hacktoberfest is an October thing. It's a month long festival of open source that is annual, currently in its eighth year and kindly sponsored by Digital Ocean. And a lot of people say that documentation is a nice, gentle way to get started with open source contributions. And it can be very difficult for folks who want to get involved in open source. You know, a lot of people say if you're in tech, get, you know, start contributing to open source software. It can really help boost your career. It can help you learn about different things. Um, people don't know where to start, but documentation is often cited as a really good way of getting started with open source. But again, documentation can be a bit of a mystery. So that's why I've put together this series of events to take away a bit of the mystery of technical writing and documentation. Redis is taking part in Hacktoberfest and we have made available quite a number of issues across all different repos. If you want to find out about them, go to developer.redis.com slash Hacktoberfest. You'll find all the information that you need about how to find the issues, how to contribute. And um, you can also have a look at some of the pull requests we've already received. I did do a live stream last week as well with Simon Prickett, our developer advocacy manager. And we had a look at some of the really good PRs that we've received so far. So check that out. It is on YouTube. So as for the documentation piece, uh, this series of live streams for the documentation consists of a panel fireside and three one-to-one -one fireside chats. So the panel fireside was about one and a half weeks ago and the recording is on YouTube. And uh, that was all with the whole documentation team, the whole doc Redis documentation team. There are three people in the team, Lance, Rachel and Caitlin. And yesterday I had a one-to-one -one fireside chat with Caitlin here on Twitch. The recording for that is on YouTube already. So go along to our YouTube channel and check that out. Today I'm with Rachel and the recording for this event is going to be on YouTube in a few hours time. So if you're watching on YouTube, please say hi in the chat. And then I've got Lance on Friday, the 29th of October. Lance manages the documentation team. So he'll be talking about what he looks for when he's hiring people and how he sets up all the processes that you need to have a successful team. So that is on Friday, the 29th of October at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, 4 p.m. UTC, and 5 p.m. in the UK. So yeah, let's bring Rachel into the stream now. Rachel Ellidge is one of our technical writers here in the Redis documentation team. Hi, Rachel, how are you today? Hello, I'm good, how are you? Yeah, I'm not bad, thanks. Like I said to Caitlin yesterday, I'm right at the end of my day. You're kind mm -hmm. of at the beginning. I think Caitlin and you are in the same time zone, we aren't you? We are, which is pretty convenient, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> That, that definitely helps. But yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm right at the end of my day now. So I've got my lamp switched on just in case mm -hmm. the, the lights go off and things like that. Uh, I don't want to be sitting here in the dark at the, the end of this uh, stream. So it's interesting to talk to all of you folks in the documentation team because you all have different backgrounds and you all bring different skills to, to the role and you all came from different places. So yesterday we spoke to Caitlin and Caitlin was not a software engineer before she became a technical writer. But I know that you were a software mm -hmm. engineer before you became a technical writer. So I wonder if we can start off by uh, just uh, just tell us about how you got to where you are now, how you became a technical writer at Redis. Sure, sure. Um, so basically, I am someone who was never really sure what I wanted to do um, as a career. And so basically I had interest in a lot of different subjects, including writing and technology. And um, when I was in college, basically I just took classes in a lot of different subjects. And while I was taking um, some introductory programming classes, I decided, oh, this is really interesting. 
um, and I liked the coursework and eventually I declared um, computer science major. Um, so yes, that is what I majored in. Um, and then during my the summer between my junior and senior year, um, I basically applied for an internship that uh, my advisor had you know, alerted me to saying, oh, hey, you might want to apply to this. Um, so I got the internship and did it over the summer. And um, I really liked my team. Um, it was a software engineer intern. And they invited me back to work full time for them um, after graduation. Uh, so I went there and worked as a software engineer for about seven years. Um, I was a full stack developer, so I kind of worked on everything, databases, APIs, backend stuff, UIs. Um, so yeah, I, <laughs> I got like a bit of experience all over the place. Um, additionally, so, and here's where the technical writing stuff comes in. We didn't always have dedicated technical writers um, for the projects we worked on, but we still needed documentation. And a lot of the people on my team really, really, really hated writing, but I liked writing um, and basically did a lot of writing for fun in my spare time, uh, usually fiction and like poetry. But um, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm happy and interested to work on our documentation. And it's good to have anyways, because sometimes, you know, especially when you've been working on a project and then like you have to come back to it a few years later, you might not remember how exactly things worked. And so it's helpful to have that history there. So you can be like, oh yeah, that's right. That's how this API works. Got it. Um, so yeah, so I helped out a lot on like API documentation um, and then like troubleshooting guides, installation guides, things like that. A lot of readmes. Um, but yeah, so basically, you know, towards the end of my seven years um, as a software engineer, I had kind of been feeling burnt out, I suppose. And I was feeling like maybe I don't want to be a software engineer full time for the rest of my life. What is something else that I could maybe do as a career um, that wouldn't be like completely throwing out my degree <laughs> that I got? and my experience. And I was like, well, I really liked the documentation pieces. And I was like, maybe I would be able to get into technical writing full time. Um, so basically, I started researching what it would take um, to transition to that sort of career. Um, started trying to get together some writing samples um, and looked around and started applying. Uh, and then I got hired at Redis. So <laughs> I'm a technical writer now. Yeah. Yeah. That is that is uh that is quite a cool story and I'm really curious mm -hmm. just as a side note as to because I think the um American university system works differently from the UK because you said that you started university and you didn't really know what you wanted to do mm -hmm. and then you took some modules in computer science and then you declared a computer science major. Yes. Whereas here you have to decide what you're going to do beforehand and then actually you enroll on that Cool. So how does it yes. work in America? Like what, what did you enroll for in the first place? So it's, it's interesting because it definitely depends on the kind of college. Um, there are definitely more, some colleges and universities that are like technical focused where you have to know ahead of time, especially if you're like going for an official engineering degree. So like my brother's an electrical engineer and he had to know ahead of time when he was applying because he went for like a, mas uh, a master's too. So it was like bachelor's plus master's. And yeah. But for me, I went to a liberal arts college because I just wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And um, liberal arts co colleges allow you and kind of expect you to um, take classes in a lot of different disciplines and become well-rounded. Um, and so usually they'll have you like declare an intended major. And my my intended major was actually neuroscience. <laughs> wow. Um, <Okay. laughs> so yeah, I, I um, it was interesting because it was also kind of like a new major at my college. Um, so it wasn't like, it was, they were still kind of like changing things a lot in it. Um, and um, Basically, so I took some classes in my intended major in neuroscience, and then I was also taking the computer science classes. And I was like, well, you know, computer science and programming is a skill that seems to be really useful anyways, like even if I don't go in that direction. And I was and, you know, a lot of medical things like software is important there, too. So I was like, well, you know, um, and then as I continued coursework in um, both uh, areas, I was like enjoying the computer science work more. Um, the neuroscience stuff was really interesting, but uh, the computer stuff felt more natural to me. 
Uh, and then there was also like concerns. I was like, oh, well, if I go neuroscience route, I'm probably going to have to like have to go to grad school to get like a good job afterwards. And computer science kind of opens a lot of doors earlier. Um, so it was like a little bit less pressure um, on like what to do after the bachelor's degree. So, yeah. <laughs> That is that is really good to hear because I'm sure there are a lot of folks listening who have either taken a humanities degree like Caitlin mm -hmm. did, or um, they've been to they're in America and they've been to a liberal arts college, and they probably they, they may not actually be thinking about it the way you've just described. They might not have recognised that actually going to these colleges gives you sort of a rounded knowledge of a lot of different subjects, mm -hmm. and actually you can exploit some of that and take it in a in a different direction like you did so mm -hmm. that is really cool to know and in some ways I think you've probably got more latitude to do that there than if you went to say university in the UK and mm -hmm. um and you were sort of stuck on one path but it seemed like a really good uh it turned out really well for you because mm -hmm. you were offered that internship so did you say that you'd taken one year of university and then worked for a year and then went back for the oh, third and fourth years? No, no. I, I went consecutive years, four consecutive years in college, but I took a summer um, oh, and did okay. an internship during the summer. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Because that's one thing that you can do in the UK. You can get degrees mm -hmm. where you do one year in mm -hmm. class. Um, no, sorry. You do two years in class and then the third year you go out and work for a year and then the fourth year you come back. But mm -hmm. I, that's what I did. I think I there's recommend. probably something similar in a lot of U.S. universities, but I, I think that's just something you have to work out with your particular college. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like that. It sounds like that internship basically put you into the, the tech world and, mm -hmm. and kind of helped you to realize that's somewhere that you could make a career for yourself. Mm hmm. And then yeah. you ended up staying seven years in that, in that <laughs> place. Yeah, yeah. I really liked my team. So that definitely helped keep me around. Yeah. No, it's good. I mean, seven years yeah. is a good, a good solid amount of time to mm -hmm. be somewhere. And it, it does show yeah. that you really enjoy the work and you, you like working in that team. Yeah. And but, I think something that I've noticed is like there's like a period of time between around like five to 10 years, which is when like a lot of people will decide maybe they want to shift to a slightly different role that seems pretty common so yeah yeah so that's seven year itch <laughs> isn't it yeah yeah so you were working for as a software engineer in that, in that company for seven years and you said that um documentation was needed but there were no dedicated documentarians shall we say there were no dedicated technical writers and you liked writing so mm -hmm. you kind of took on that mantle how was it for you then? You know, if there weren't any role models there, then we had some you technical writers, that? just not always. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So when you say not always, then did they? So they, they had. Through? They they were hired full time, but they had other projects sometimes that were higher priority to have official documentation on. Um, and so basically some of the projects that I worked on, they were like, well, our technical writers don't have time for you. So <laughs> do it yourself. <laughs> OK, yeah. so how did you how did you know how to do it then in the first place? Like, where did you draw your inspiration, your guidance from mm -hmm. when you first started out mm -hmm. documenting stuff? So when I first started, we actually did have a technical writer on the project that I was working on. So they had kind of gotten things started. And then they had to be pulled into something else and couldn't help anymore um, with our project. So I at least had like a base to start off on and like something to reference. Um, and so that was a little bit of that. Um, plus, sometimes you just pick some stuff up like as you're like reading other other places documentation. And, so, you know, it's always hit and miss whether or not you think like this documentation is good or not <laughs> to use as a model. But, um, you know. <laughs> Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the different types of documentation you were creating in mm. that job then, because you obviously you were coding mm -hmm. and doing the documentation as well. So, yes. yeah. Yes. So one of the earliest ones that I would work on a lot was um, basically we there was an API uh, for my first main project um, that I would contribute to. And then I would also go and update our API, our existing API doc to include all the new information and changes. Um, I also would go through uh, and like test out some of our existing endpoints um, that had been documented. And if I found problems where it was unclear, 
um, or was missing information, I would go and update that as well. Um, and then like the main users of like that API documentation besides like us where we had data analysts basically who would use our API. Um, and so a lot of times I'd interact with them and figure out, you know, what are questions they had? <laughs> what are we missing? Um, so that was very helpful. Um, additionally, I did um, some basically like tutorials I put together. Um, like it wasn't just documentation, it was also like example code um, and stuff. I did tutorials for using Zero and Q with Java um, and like pass that around uh, to some other groups in our company who were interested in implementing that. Um, so got some experience there. I did some readme's um, for some of our different components because whenever we hired new people, um, sometimes it was confusing to figure out um, you know, how do I actually like start this project? Um, so I did some readme guides, which were basically like set up installation, other information. Um, and then like further on, um, I would work on like design documents a lot um, for new features that were coming. I would help with documentation for um, QA uh, so that our testers um, knew what to test uh, if they were like just thrown into the project and weren't really familiar. Um, I also did more installation guides because <laughs> um, one of my last projects, uh, my last job was very, very massive. And it basically was um, like a front end, like scheduler type UI that would connect to all of the other pieces of software throughout the company. And so my team didn't have time to like get everything working. Like we did not always have time. So we would bring in developers from the other teams and be like, okay, well you can contribute to our project um, and this will help you get the pieces you need faster, but they would just be thrown into the deep end. And like, it was a very complicated project. So um, I helped out with getting those, you know, set up and installation guides sorted for that. Um, and like whenever people ran into weird problems because everyone was working with different environments, we had Windows, Linux, Mac, you know, everybody was working on different things basically. And so sometimes we would have a problem with one OS and not the other. So like if someone ran into that and I was helping them figure out, you know, what was missing or how to fix it, um, I would add that to our like troubleshooting guides so that the next person who ran into that had somewhere uh, to figure out what was wrong without having to like do all the research from scratch again yeah yeah it definitely sounds like you were the queen of explaining things at that company <laughs> because all the different things that you have put together to help people to figure out stuff and like you say um documentation really does help people to avoid having to reinvent the wheel Mm -hmm. and go through that whole loop of you know how do I do this I've got to research all these things somebody's already done the hard work and all mm -hmm. you have to do is know where to find the documentation know where that kind of knowledge management is mm -hmm. and uh, just go and read the docs that somebody's already had that problem um, in some ways like documentation is sort of a like a like a manifestation of an FAQ it's thinking about what questions that person's going to have in their head when they're doing something isn't it mm -hmm. and preemptively answering them um to make the, the experience frictionless mm -hmm. so with the the documentation you, you had this sort of role alongside your software engineering job and you did have some role models and some folks that were employed to do this job as well that you looked to so every everywhere that writes anything has got a different style and a different tone of voice and things like that. Did you have any influence over the style and tone of voice or were you following a style guide that the documentation yeah. people would? So we on? didn't really have a style guide that I was given to follow. Um, but if there was already an existing project that seemed well put together, <laughs> I would just try to be consistent with what they were already doing. Um, for things that I was writing from scratch, a lot of times I would base it on my previous experience um, or like what other people in the industry were doing. But yeah, we didn't really use official style guides. Um, it's possible that um, so this may be, maybe I should give some context. Um, most of our documentation was internal. So it wasn't like random public would usually be seeing it. So it's possible that maybe that's why the style guides weren't as prevalent um, at my last job. But yeah, when you have public facing documentation, 
it's a good idea to <laughs> make sure you're really consistent. Um, yeah. What do we what do we use at Redis to uh, to ensure consistent tone mm -hmm. of voice? Mm -hmm. So we mostly follow the Google style guide. Um, we do sometimes also re reference the Microsoft style guide as well, but um, we've mostly been looking at Google. Uh, and then there's also like um, some like in-house Redis style points uh, for like how to name things or like capitalization, whether or not things have hyphens. So we, we have some in-house style guidelines as well. Um, so yeah. And then aside from that, if we can't find like something specific in a style guide and we're not sure about it, a lot of times we'll just consult with the rest of the docs team and be like, what do you think? <laughs> Yeah, that's the so. beauty of having like two other professional writers yeah. there that have come from different places. You can kind of yeah. put your minds together and think, you know, what's the best way to do it for this particular scenario? So you spoke about the Google Star Guide. Can you give us a bit of a flavor for folks who aren't familiar with that? What kind of things the Google Star Guide guides you on? What kind of things does it sort of, um, what mm -hmm. sort of framework does it give you to operate in? Mm -hmm. So it has a lot of useful information. It has a lot of things that are related to grammar, you know, um, proper usage of like commas and hyphens, parentheses, all of that. Um, but additionally, it also has a lot of guidelines on accessibility. So um, they'll have like word lists uh, where it'll like, you can go and look up a word that you might be using and check it in the style guide and see, is this a word that's suggested or is this a word that's potentially problematic? Um, or confusing. Um, so that's really useful because there is there is some language um, that you might be used to um, using that's like maybe not as helpful for like general public. Um, so yeah, um, I, a good example is uh, that like, I think that Lance really likes is using select versus click. So like a lot okay. of times classically, um, people will say, click on this, click on that. Um, but that's not useful for like, if you're using um, like a browser on a phone where you'd be like tapping instead, or um, maybe you're using an alternative type of setup that doesn't have a classic click uh, clicker or mouse. Um, so select is more inclusive to all those people um, who are using a different kind of setup. Um, that is a very good like point. Yeah, that's a very good point because whenever I, um, you know, if I'm just texting somebody and I'm like, I'll go to this page and click on this. What I really mean is press on this because they're mm -hmm. on their phone. But it's right. easier to say click because yeah. that's the classic way that we've always done this. But your yeah. point about accessibility is spot on because not only should your software be inclusive and accessible, then your mm -hmm. documentation should be as well. And so, like you say, you know, some folks are using assistive technology mm -hmm. and so they're not clicking, they are selecting something, they're telling their technology to select this option. Mm -hmm. um, they may not be using a mouse. So yeah, that's definitely something we need to bear in mind as software creators or folks that are involved in the software creation process, which is definitely what the documentation team is. You're, you're helping to shape the product and you're helping people to use it Mm -hmm. And we need to recognize that all different types of people are using this thing, not just people who are like us. So, yeah, so we spoke about the, the style guides and that's one set of tooling, if you like, that guides mm -hmm. you in, in your role. Can you talk to me a little bit more about the other types of tooling that you use? Because I know, I think you use Markdown mm -hmm. for the documentation and then you've got a whole sort of, I think you've got a continuous improvement, integration process yes. and things like that. Can you talk me through some of the tooling that you're using? Yes, yes, I can. Um, so like you said, we do use Markdown uh, basically to create our documents. And we also are using Hugo, which is um, a static site generator. So um, basically what I usually do is I use Visual Studio Code to edit our Markdown files. And we also have like a series of like CSS files for um, you know formatting the website. We have um, a bunch of HTML layouts uh, as well. So um, a lot of times I'll edit it in Visual Studio Code and I'll be running Hugo Serve um, in the background. And that lets us um, basically watch our updates live. Um, so we have like a nice little local preview of the website um, 
just going as we type and like every time you hit save, it'll update and you can see your changes. And that's definitely very useful um, because once we have our um, documents ready, we check them in to our GitHub project. And so once we have it checked into our GitHub project, we have some automation um, set up so that we have, well, we're using Circle CI for continuous integration and deployment. So basically, um, once we check in our code to GitHub, it will trigger uh, the Circle CI process and it will go and push out our um, files to our S3 bucket, which is where we host our static site. Um, and we can just go to our staged um, URL and see a nice preview of what's going to look like. And then eventually we have like our main um, site, which is like our latest. And so like we have a whole process for that too. Um, that's a bit more specific since, um, you know, it's like the end game. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, let me think what else. Um, aside from those things, that's kind of like our main docs process, but um, I also use like command line a lot. Um, Vim is the command line editor I like to use, um, just what I'm used to. And it's pretty powerful. Um, hmm. Yeah. yeah, you said it's funny. You, you said it was the end game, but at least you're not uh, you're not typing it on a typewriter, yeah. sending it to a printer. Can you imagine if you were making this huge fat manual like yeah. in the old days, and there was a typo or something like, yes, okay, it's the end game, but it's quite easy to change things. Yes. Like if you notice the mistakes, yes. so uh, so yeah, that's one of the good forms of progress that we've had in this whole uh, this whole writing thing. <laughs> Um, over the years so you mentioned quite a lot of different technologies there that I think a lot of software engineers have heard of if they don't mm -hmm. use already are these some of the things that you were already using when you were a software engineer slash technical writer in your previous roles so some of them I had never used Hugo before um, so that was new for me um, I was already really familiar with Git because that's the version control um, that we use for most of my career. We had used Subversion early on and then like switched it all over to Git. And it, it, it's like some people get like intimidated by Git, but it's, re it's really, really powerful. So I liked it. <laughs> um, what else? I was already familiar with Markdown because I had used that for a lot of our readme's. Um, I already was familiar with AWS S3. Um, the S3 buckets, because I had used those at my last job as well. Um, command line, obviously, I had used that a lot <laughs> at my last job. Uh, yeah, so some things. I had never used Circle CI before, but I had used other like integration deployment, but um, some of it was like in house stuff that was like written at my company. So it, yeah, right. <laughs> that was actually okay. sometimes kind of hard because like you couldn't just go and look up online how to get help on that and like a lot of it wasn't documented <laughs> so. that, that's quite ironic really isn't it? yeah <laughs> yeah it was, yeah. was kind of old <laughs> yeah yeah so i can see then that being a software engineer you did have experience in some of the technologies that you are mm -hmm. using now but obviously caitlin who we spoke to yesterday was not a software engineer and she picked it up. So I think the message there is if you have experience in software engineering and you know version control and things like that and continuous integration, then um, you should be able to like look at these tools and think, okay, yeah, I kind of know the, the principles behind mm -hmm. this. But if you don't have the experience, then it's not impossible to learn it you, you mm -hmm. can learn it so you see you mentioned circle ci was not something that you specifically had used before mm -hmm. how did you go about learning about that and how to use it mm -hmm. so a couple of things is we did already have an existing um, configuration file for circle ci and the project was already set up when i started uh working here um, and so basically I went and looked at like what already existed and then i would also go to circle ci's documentation um, because they have a, a documentation website. And I would go and read about, um, OK, so what are these like commands? Like, how do I use this? Um, and so, yeah, that was a really, really good resource um, for figuring out. And um, it definitely helped me get up to speed because I did early on um, need to make changes to our CircleCI configuration project. Um, so yeah. 
documentation is yeah. great if <laughs> when it exists <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's the big if isn't it if it exists yeah. then it's brilliant it helps everybody including yeah. the technical writers but yeah you, you it's one of those things that you definitely notice when it's not there yeah it's uh yeah, yeah when it's I there i don't remember what it was but there was something i had <laughs> been trying to use one time and i was like i had to like go in and like look at the source code to figure out what was going on because there was like no documentation i was like well good thing i can look at the source code because <laughs> I would have yeah. never figured this out otherwise. Yeah, it just takes so much longer, doesn't it? Yeah, it takes definitely. so much longer. I think there's definitely, um, for me, I've noticed uh, having to pick up new technologies with the pandemic and things like that. We're all working remotely, so I've mm -hmm. used Zoom a lot more in the past eighteen months than ever in my life, as I think a lot of people have. Yeah. And I personally find the Zoom documentation really good. Mm -hmm. Any question that I can think of is documented in there but you can't say that for everything unfortunately mm -hmm. but you know it's not an easy thing to do it's not an easy mm -hmm. thing to manage we have three te technical writers at redis and it would be brilliant if we had loads loads more because <laughs> i'm sure that you know you're only working on a tiny bit of the stuff that you would really love to work on mm -hmm. because yeah there's, there's a so lot to do yeah <laughs> yeah yeah you kind of have to pick off the priority stuff but yes. um yeah, I don't know how companies like Zoom do it. They, I suppose some of them outsource the the writing, don't they? they just... Sometimes. Sometimes I'll do like contract work um, for for part of it and then have some full-time uh, employees. But yeah, it definitely just depends on the company. You know? Yeah, yeah. So um, we talked about the fact that you've got a lot of projects on at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, how do you plan out you know you're sitting there with a blank page how do you plan out what you're going to write like what's the process that you go through when you decide how you're gonna mm -hmm. structure this thing yeah so for planning what to write a lot of times um there will be a period of like research and like requirement collection so a lot of times you'll talk to like um the pms and they can give you some direction a lot of times on like okay this is like at least the basics of what we need um and then something that I found really helpful is um, when some of the developers have done like uh, presentations on the new features. I really love that because I can go and watch that um, and it lets me get a good feel for it live um, because like you can explore things yourself to an extent, but sometimes things aren't ready. So you're relying like, especially if it's like not as close to release, um, release of the feature as, um, you may be, that would maybe be helpful. Um, so like if something's like currently being tested or something, um, yeah, it's sometimes a little more effort to like track down how to find out what to write um, because you might not have access to it yet. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, I can see why watching a presentation by somebody would really help you because mm -hmm they've already selected the bits that they think that you need to know about, mm -hmm. uh, like which, like you say, saves you having to kind of fiddle about and um, mm -hmm. play with it yourself because how are you supposed mm -hmm. to know where to start? Uh, so, yeah, definitely it's, it's yeah. almost like getting a demonstration from them. Yes, isn't it? and if you, do, if you do have access to play around with it, then that's great too. Um, and once you're at that stage, then you can kind of have a better idea of like, these are the questions I have um, as I'm going through this process. And that can help you uh, decide what all to include um, in your documentation piece, so. Yeah. Are you finding that because you were a software engineer before, or you, mm -hmm. well, you are a software engineer, but you, you've got that experience, that it's easy for you on, to understand quite quickly when they explain it to you or, or not? Yeah, um, so most of it, I think I, my engineering experience has helped me um, understand more quickly than if I didn't have the experience. Um, but some concepts are still really complicated. So <laughs> it depends. Um, I do think it's very helpful that uh, my past experience makes it easy for me to go read source code. So like sometimes there would be something missing and, um, you know, it's sometimes hard to get a hold of people because they're really busy and like different time zones and all of that. So it's like if it's something that I think that I can just go and check the source code real quick um, and figure out, then that's great. Um, 
And I found that useful. So yeah, sometimes it's like, oh, we have some missing like explanation. And sometimes I'll go in and someone has left a comment there. I'm like, oh, great. That explains exactly <laughs> what this does. Awesome. Yeah, that is handy that you can go in and read the code and to try and get a clue there. Because like you say, people aren't always on tap for you to ask the question to, yeah. are they? Yeah. Uh, but so you were working on totally different software for seven years before you, you came as a full-time technical writer to Redis. And you were a full stack software engineer in your mm -hmm. previous company. Uh, so you're working on the front end and the back end. But were you yeah. using Redis at that point? No, we were not. Um, we mostly used my SQL. Uh, so that was the main database experience I had. Um, but I had heard of Redis before. So like at my last job, um, a lot of people were talking about it because they were interested in the new SQL uh, databases. And I think I also had heard of it at um, some like tech conferences I went to, but we never actually used it at my at my job. Right. OK, mm -hmm. so you came into Redis and you hadn't ever used it. So how did you get yourself up to speed? Because you don't need to know everything about mm -hmm. it. How did you sort of set out that learning path for yourself um, mm -hmm. to get to the point where you needed to be to be able to do the role? Mm -hmm. So um, when I first started, uh, I was given a document. Um, I know Caitlin mentioned something similar yesterday in her talk, uh, a document that had a big plan on how to get familiar with everything, how to um, get access to the things we needed. So there, it included some like tutorials on how to get started with open source Redis. Um, we also had, uh, I basically had technical enablement training um, that kind of introduced me to some of the other aspects of Redis besides open source. So it introduced me to the software and to the cloud. Um, and that was run by uh, Redis's technical enablement team. I also attended a customer training um, on the Redis software, uh, Redis enterprise software. So um, that was all really, really helpful. And it, I'm very glad that I had the opportunity to learn all that stuff early on. Um, it definitely made it less intimidating. So that's good. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like there were a lot of different ways that you you were sort of given opportunities mm -hmm. to learn. Because I can imagine, like, I mean, Caitlin was saying yesterday that some places just sort of throw you in and say, oh, just go and have a play with <laughs> yeah. it. Well, yeah, that's not very that's not very helpful because you don't know what the important bits are, do you? Yeah. Yeah. So it was good that they had so many good learning resources. Uh, yeah. So this is encouraging, I think, for folks that are watching who want to get into technical writing because you had not used Redis, although you had heard of it, mm -hmm. and Caitlin had not used Redis either. So it shows that you can actually go and get a job at doing technical writing for um, a technology that you haven't necessarily used before. How, how would you advise people to demonstrate that they can do the role of technical writer Mm -hmm. um, especially if they've never used that technology before you because you can't rely on the fact that I've used this and so I understand it and you know I've also done this and therefore I can explain it you've kind of lost that part of the equation haven't you so how mm -hmm. how can people prove that they can do the role mm -hmm. so I guess there's a couple of parts to it um, obviously you know you need to be comfortable with writing and being able to write in a concise way that people will find easy to understand, um, hopefully. <laughs> um, so writing samples are really good uh, to get together um, for your applications. Um, they don't have to be like super technical or anything, um, but just something that demonstrates you can explain something to someone who's maybe new uh, to that information. Um, I think that's really good. Uh, additionally, um, like if you can get involved in open source projects, that's an option. Um, and I guess a big part of it's going to be uh, like once you've managed to get an interview with a company um, during the interviews, uh, people will kind of be able to like ask you questions to figure out, um, you know, your proficiency and learning new things that are thrown at you. Um, so I guess something that would be good to like demonstrate that you can learn learn new things um, pretty quickly is maybe just take on a new project. Um, for me, like probably if I hadn't um, ended up already being hired by Redis, uh, I probably would have started trying to put together some st uh, static generated websites um, and then have that out there. 
uh, to show that, hey, I'm new to this, but I've figured it out. Um, so things like that, uh, if you have time, are probably good uh, to add to your portfolio. Yeah, yeah, but that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also wondering as well, what did the recruitment process look like for your job or any other technical writing job that you, mm -hmm. you've been for in the past? You know, what does that typically look like? You, mm -hmm. do, you have to supply some writing samples, but, you know, what are the interviews like and how many of them are there and stuff? Because for software engineering, they can go on for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, basically, yeah, there would be an initial application and usually you would provide some writing samples at that point. Um, Sometimes they would also ask like if you had like a GitHub repo or something you wanted to share. Um, so like if you had like a static generated site hosted on like GitHub, that's a good opportunity to be like, here you go. <laughs> um, but I did not have that at the time. Uh, and so basically um, once you get like callback callbacks from the recruiters, um, you'll usually have at least one or two um, interviews, initial interviews with the recruiter. Um, and then if they decide to move forward in the process, uh, they'll usually try to get you um, interviews with either like the team leader uh, that you'll be working with or your co co-workers or both, um, or your, sorry, your future co-workers or both. And um, yeah, and so you just kind of like sit in on those interviews and They'll ask questions kind of about how you approach writing um, and kind of like your research style and maybe some things like, how are you with working with different time zones? Because that was relevant <laughs> for Java Redis. Um, things like that. Uh, you might have another uh, interview with HR at some point. Um, there's also likely to be a writing exercise in addition to your samples that you've provided. So, um, the one that I had for Redis, um, basically I was given an old document that needed a lot of work. Um, this was kind of just like an old example. And um, I had a chance to look at it and like get together some thoughts on like, how would I improve this document? And then I just presented that um, to a team leader during another interview. Um, I know some places do will do live writing, which um, is probably a little bit more stressful uh, where they stare at you while you write. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so don't be scared by that, but that that might sometimes happen. <laughs> okay, Rachel's just told us the scariest thing ever. Right? <laughs> well, don't worry, everybody. It's fine. Don't be scared. But like it'll be it'll be another writer like, you know, proctoring that. So like they know that like writing under pressure and first writing isn't ever going to be like perfect. So it's just kind of to get an idea of like how you work. Um, yeah, it does yeah. sound a little bit like the whole uh, live programming when you go for a software engineering role. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. yeah it's I'm not funny, sure how common that is. I just know some places do it. Yeah, but it's good to know though, because I yeah. didn't know that places did that. So I'm really yeah. glad that you mentioned it because I'm sure a lot of folks watching did not realize that too. So uh, mm -hmm. it, it just helps people to be prepared for that possibility because I know like I worked in marketing for quite a long time and I specialized in communications. So there was a lot of writing involved with that different type of writing. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of interviews that I went for, they would say, okay, we write us a press release about this mm -hmm. and they give you some basic information, which is sort of the same, but they didn't sit there and watch you do it. So what they would do is they'd <laughs> send you into another room with a computer, you'd write out your thing and then uh, you'd come back and then do the, mm -hmm. the Q and A with the uh, the interview, and they the, mm -hmm. they'd have a look at it and stuff. So it was never like an actual live thing. But I think mm -hmm. the tech industry really loves live <laughs> live tests. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think so uh, too. there's yeah. another thing that I didn't have to do, but I know that some some jobs um, will ask. Uh, sometimes they'll give like an actual writing test to like I guess right. make sure that you understand grammar and stuff but I didn't have to take one of those and it's possible that maybe that's something that's more likely to be given if you don't, can't provide um writing samples but they're still interested so that's a possibility but I don't think that's like as common as just the samples slash an editing exercise yeah so. hmm 
you can sort of see why people do that because if your role is going to be technical writer they want to make sure that when they hire you that you can construct the sentences and the paragraphs properly and you've got mm -hmm. good grammar and spelling and things like that because you can't solely rely on the grammar check and the spelling check mm -hmm. can you they're not always yeah they're not right. always accurate or ideal yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so you do need to have some level of competence but like you say there's a lot of resources out there that can help you mm -hmm. with that I know I don't know what it's like in America but in the UK I think that you know teaching those those parts of speech in English and things like that the grammar is not something that all schools have done at an early yeah. enough age so a lot of people can leave school and not be able to do that but luckily mm -hmm. there's a lot of resources out there that can teach you that stuff that you yeah. probably should have been taught at at school so if somebody is a software engineer like you were and they're thinking about becoming a technical writer but didn't they're not necessarily in the position where they've got the opportunity like you did to get involved with documentation in the current role what advice would you give them to uh, to make that pivot into technical writing full-time mm -hmm. right so um, I know we already mentioned it a little bit, but um, if you, there's a lot of open source projects that would like people to help with their documentation. Um, and so, you know, a software engineer could go and help out with that uh, possibly if they want, or if they are someone who has their own projects um, that they like to host, write your documentation for your own project too. Um, and show that off and be like, look, look how awesome this documentation I wrote is. And you can have that in your portfolio. Um, but it probably is good to also, like I said, work with other people's, writing documentation for other people's things too. Because like anything that you write yourself, you're gonna know better than anyone else. And like, but on the actual technical writing job, you're not the one writing that software normally. So you have to be able to work with other people's creations as well um so yeah that's very true if you've created it you know everything about it so you've got an unfair advantage yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to write that documentation and um, like you said earlier if you do write up some documentation for a piece of software then it might save you from the dreaded live test because you can show samples of your writing mm -hmm. uh, which hopefully are acceptable to them and, and they won't have to to do it so um so yeah, so we've spoken about, you know, the research skills that you need and the writing skills that you need. What other skills do you think uh, that you were able to bring from your previous role mm -hmm. into your technical writing role that have really helped you to, to succeed in technical writing? Mm -hmm. So yeah, a lot of my experience as an engineer really did help, like having the previous experience with some of the tools um, and just like concepts was very, very useful. I feel like it would have been harder for me to get up to speed if I didn't already have that knowledge, but it's of course doable for um, anyone who is good at research or, um, you know, is willing to put in the effort to learn. Um, so some really important skills in, uh, are probably research ability. Um, the ability to organize information uh, is really important. Um, because even if you're a good writer uh, and like the sense of like, you know how grammar works, you still need to know how to position information in a way that makes sense to a user or a reader uh, so that they don't get lost while they're trying to figure out what they're doing. Because especially like with um, online documentation, people might just be skimming it or like skipping around. Um, so it's good to like demarcate like clear lines of okay, you want to do this specific task, here's where you go, and here's the instructions. Um, so yeah, organization is really important. And then I I don't know if I'd say that I'm like amazing at it, but time management is really important, uh, especially if you're working on a bunch of different projects simultaneously. Um, because yeah, you need to be able to figure out um, like how much time you can dedicate to each thing and still be able to finish stuff. Um, so those are all some skills that I think are really important. Uh, or, yeah, I can imagine. They're very nice to have. <laughs> yes, I can imagine the time management sometimes goes out the window because yeah. like for me, if I have to sit down and write something, sometimes I just can't think of what to write. Yeah. It's like, I need to get this done today. I heard don't have a choice. <laughs> um, so yeah, I can imagine that whole writer's block thing 
can be quite difficult. Do you ever get writer's block? I do. I do get writer's block. But for me, it's a lot worse if I'm like writing fiction. <laughs> okay. I, I don't find it as bad when I at least have like a clear goal in mind. So like if I have a clear goal, like I need to document this task, at least I have a direction to follow. Um, so yeah, I would say the writer's block isn't as bad with this sort of writing than as as if you're like writing just completely free. <laughs> Yeah, if you've got a blank yeah. page, you have like, like no too much choice. Like, what should I start with? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, just in case anybody does have writer's block, uh, are there any techniques that you've you found mm -hmm. from you know your hobby writing mm -hmm. or your fiction writing um, that you can give people if they're struggling mm -hmm. with that? Yeah, so there's a lot of different things that people can try to do to like get around the writer's block. Um, something that I like to do is sometimes I just have to step away from it for a tiny bit, maybe even just like work on a different piece of writing for a while and then come back later. Um, sometimes even just looking away from the screen for a bit, like take a glance outside or go outside for a second and then come back um, might be enough to help reset your brain so that you don't feel stuck anymore. Um, yeah, that's that's one of the big things. Um, Similar to going. Oh no, it's it's fine. I was just thinking because like that's kind of like the main thing I have. Uh, but I know other people kind of find their own techniques that help them. So it might be more on an individual level, but. Yeah, and what you said sounds quite similar to the advice people give software engineers if they yeah. come across a bug, they yes. can't fix, uh, or they literally yes. just can't get something to work at That all. is very familiar. <laughs> there is definitely times where um, it was like, oh, I can't figure this out, and then step away for a day and then come back and it's like, oh, okay, now it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Go away and look at it with fresh eyes, I think. Or if you can, go away and do something else and come mm -hmm. back, like, with the writing, it sounded a bit like you were saying, go away, try another piece of writing, get the juices flowing a bit, yeah. and then kind of uh, ride that momentum into the piece of work that you were trying to do originally. Sounds good. In terms of um, other skills, so you talked about time management, organizing, um, research. Mm -hmm. What about sort of the people type skills? Um, mm -hmm. What kind of people skills are you finding that you're having to use a lot in technical writing? Um, I guess <laughs> being, um, I'm trying to think of like, what's the right word for this? So you have to be able to like go and bug people, but without actually like annoying them. <laughs> I can't think of like a good descriptor for that, but you know, yeah. everyone's really busy, but sometimes you need, you need some help getting the information. So you know, you have to either like go and message them or like sometimes repeatedly to be like, Hey, I still need help with this. So you can't be like a pushover, but you also don't want to be confrontational because you don't want to like upset anyone. Um, so I'd say being able to balance, you know, being able to balance something like that is probably pretty important. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I can imagine because if you don't know how this thing works and you're having to ask people to get the information because you need to convey, like you can't do your job if you don't get that information. Right. And sometimes the way they're explaining it to you might not might not be what resonates with you and you just don't get it and you need them to keep you need to keep going back and saying can you explain it another way or can you yeah. repeat this or you know I didn't write that bit down or I forgot to ask you because yeah. I didn't realize that was a step yeah so yeah totally I guess though that that comes with maybe building a relationship with that person so that you get to understand how they work and mm -hmm. they get to understand how you work and I think that can probably help quite a lot can't it mm -hmm. but uh I can see why that would be quite difficult in the beginning when you're just starting off a new project with somebody maybe mm -hmm. yeah okay so we're coming very close to the end of the time with you today so uh the last question I want to ask you is so you know you worked for a long time as a software engineer you're now a technical writer you hadn't used Redis before though you had heard about it mm -hmm. and there were a lot of tooling um, a lot of tools that you had used before, some that you hadn't, so you had to learn about those as well. So what are you excited to learn about or work on next? Hmm. Okay, well, there's definitely like a lot of 
things at Redis that I haven't had a chance to like really work on. So we have um, basically most of the stuff I've done so far has been in the Redis Enterprise software section and then a little bit in Redis Cloud. But we have a lot of other products um, that we are probably going to start helping with documentation on. So like there's a UI, Redis Insight. I'm interested in that. We have all these modules. Um, that exists, but we aren't currently, the documentation team isn't currently the one maintaining most of that yet, but it was kind of something that we might be helping out with soon. Um, so I think that could be interesting. Um, there's a bunch of like developer, uh, so basically like clients, Redis clients um, that have some documentation they might get involved in. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff that I haven't had a chance to like really work with yet um, that might be coming up in the future and that'll be cool. So. <laughs> Yeah, like you say, there's so much stuff and there's only yeah. three of you. So that there's yeah. loads of different things that you can get involved in the future. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much, Rachel, for your time today. It's been Thank really you. cool hearing about your journey because, you know, it, everybody's journey is unique. And I think there's a lot of folks working in software engineering that are curious about uh, technical writing and they, they haven't got a clue where to start with it. So I think mm -hmm. that what you said today is really going to help a lot of people. So thank you for that. No problem. Thanks for having me. No worries. It was, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, like I said, that was Rachel Elledge, one of our technical writers here in the documentation team at Redis. And the video of this live stream will be on YouTube very soon. So look out for that. Follow. Do uh, subscribe to us on YouTube and you'll get a push notification when that video is uploaded very soon. And I will be speaking to Lance Leonard next. That will be the final uh, live stream in this series. Lance is the team leader for the documentation team here at Redis. And that will be on Friday, the 29th of October at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, 4 p.m. UTC and 5 p.m. in the UK. Like I said, this is part of our Hacktoberfest series for demystifying technical writing. If you want to catch any of the videos, please go onto our YouTube page or you can go on to developer.redis.com slash Hacktoberfest to get links to all the videos and also information about all of the things that Redis is doing during this October for Hacktoberfest. So I hope to see you again for another live stream very soon. Until then, look after yourself and take care. Thank you. Bye.